I'm very happy to have you join me for the continuation of our studies in the book of Esther. I'd like to thank our young people first of all and indeed others as well for watching over these past number of months. I appreciate your faithful support. This will be the last young people's message posted for a little while. We're into the summer months now. Our fellowship meetings would have been ended a number of weeks ago, so I feel that a break would be appropriate at this time. We hope to return again in the autumn time, either in a normal church meeting, if government regulations allow, or on Facebook or YouTube. So please look out for information about those meetings near to the time. Before I read some verses tonight from Esther chapter 3, let's bow together in a word of prayer. Eternal God and our everlasting Father, we come into thy presence tonight in Christ's name. We give thee thanks that we're able to approach thee upon the ground of redemption, pleading alone the merit of the Saviour's precious blood and his finished work, asking thee, O God, to open up our hearts to receive the engrafted word that is able to save the soul. We thank thee for our young people, we bless the Lord for each and every one of them. We ask that thou wilt remember them and just now as we look into the scripture for a few moments. We pray that the word of God will come with power and grace and passion and instruction to our hearts. Help us to live for thee and remember those who belong to thee, Lord. Bless us indeed. And in these times, may we enjoy the grace and the presence of God. And so, bless all of our young people. Remember their family situations and circumstances. And help us all to know and enjoy thy presence and thy grace day by day. In Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Our scripture reading, as I say, is taken from the book of Esther, chapter 3. As we continue with this study of this little book that bears the name of Esther, and we'll come to read the word of God, chapter 3, reading from verse 1. After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advance him, and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced. Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass, when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman, to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand. For he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone. For they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom, of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. Amen. We'll end our reading at verse 6. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts. The words I like to use as a text are found at the end of verse 2 of this third chapter. Here we read concerning Haman and Mordecai, that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. There's perhaps three or four years between the end of chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 3 in this book. If you look at chapter 2 verse 16, you will see that Esther became king or queen in the 10th month of the 7th year of the reign of Ahasuerus. You compare that with chapter 3 and the verse 7. You'll discover that mention is made of the events of this chapter 3 taking place on the first month of the 12th year of his reign. 
It's important to remember that Bible history isn't always a full history. The Lord records those events and circumstances that are important to what he wants to teach us. So, as is the case here, there's an interval very often between chapters in Scripture, between books in Scripture, indeed between verses of Scripture at some time, as far as time is concerned. And in this case then, there's an interval of around four years between chapter 2 and chapter 3. In that period, no doubt, Esther becomes more established as queen in the land. She learns more and more of what's expected of her. Mordecai also remains as a man of some influence in the kingdom and in the empire, generally speaking. But a new figure now appears in the scene. A man by the name of Haman, described in verse 1 as the son of Hamadatha and Agagite. I'd like you to think for a moment or two, firstly about the promotion of this individual. His promotion. Because from his name and from his background, it is probable that Haman was a descendant of Agag. Now Agag was an Amalekite king whom Samuel slew in the days of Saul, the first king of Israel. And what is true and what can be seen from Haman is his hatred for the people of God. Verse 6 tells us that he sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. In chapter 9 and the verse 10, we discover that Haman is addressed as the enemy of the Jews. The Jews have had many enemies down through the years. You wouldn't have to think too long about that for the actions of Hitler and the Nazis to come to your mind and their heartless and barbaric attempts to wipe out the Jews completely in the time of the Second World War. Or you might consider Herod and the slaying of the baby Jewish boys under two years old at the time of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or again, by way of example, you could go back in your mind to the infancy of Moses and the judgment of death again upon the infant boys at the command of Pharaoh in Egypt. Even in these days, there are constant attacks upon the land of Israel and the Jews at the hand of their enemies, both in Israel and in other places throughout the world, because the Jews are hated by many for the simple reason that they are the ancient people of God. And yet you and I tonight owe a great debt to the Jews, because it's through the Jews, for example, that we have the word of God, the ancient writers, of both the Old Testament and the New Testament were Jews. Of course, from the human perspective also, the Lord Jesus was born a Jew. Pilate described him in the letters that were written above the cross as the King of the Jews. And the Bible decrees that you and I, as the people of God, are to pray for the Jews. And indeed, in Psalm 122, for the peace of Jerusalem. Because the Lord has a special place in his heart for the Jewish people. And likewise, he has a special place in his heart for the city of Jerusalem, the city of the great king. The city where, in his providential will, the great temple where the Lord abided was built. You read also Psalm 124, for example, and you'll see how the Lord has for generations been on the side of the Jews. If he hadn't protected them, they'd have been wiped out years ago because the Jews have and have had many, many enemies. Haman is just one in a line of many millions of individuals who have hated the Jews, and that hatred is stretched to nations as well. This is the man, 
Haman, who was raised up to one of the chief positions in the Persian Empire. Notice from verse 1 some words that are used to describe how he came to this position. Firstly, the Bible says in verse 1 that he was promoted. That is, he was promoted from a lesser position. The word advanced is also used in relation to this promotion. And the word advanced means to lift up or exalt. So he was brought into an exalted position. Secondly, he was set above, the Bible says, he was set above the princes. He was promoted and advanced, firstly. And also, he was set above all the princes. Those words promoted and advanced would mean how he was to be regarded by others. The fact that the Bible says that he was set above all the princes speaks of a more practical idea. It is the idea of having a throne made for him. And therefore, here is this man, and he comes, if you like, putting all of these ideas together. And probably the thought behind verse 1 is that of a rapid rise, someone being brought into the center of power, as it were, from out of the blue. And he has ascended by the king's commandment to this position of authority. The king also, from what's said in verse 1, arranges for this special throne to be erected that caused him, when he was sitting upon it, to be raised up above all the other princes in the Persian Empire as well. And so this man comes, I would say it almost from nowhere, to this position of great authority. You'll remember perhaps from the end of chapter 2 how Mordecai had saved the king's life. And on thinking upon that, we could draw the conclusion that if there was an opening in central government in the Persian Empire for a man to be promoted and exalted, it should have been Mordecai. There's nothing in Haman's past that's recorded by the Lord here that would possibly indicate that this man deserved to be in this position. However, the king owed Mordecai his life. But instead of Mordecai being the object of this promotion, this bitter, arrogant, hateful man is placed in a position of authority. You often find that. It seems sometimes that if the individual is more of an underhand person, the more they seem to get on in life. And things seem to favour them to the expense of the, the godly. It could be that you have suffered like that. Maybe you've been overlooked for a job promotion or some other honour because of your allegiance to Christ as your saviour. And some individual who was less worthy found themselves promoted to that position and you felt sore and hurt and hard done by, but often that's the way it is in the world. The best thing that you can do is just to leave it in the Lord's hands and the Lord, allow the Lord to deal with it in his time. More, Mordecai, I suppose, had a case for crying discrimination, but he didn't. He let it go. And so there is this individual raised to this position. Think also of the power of Haman as it's described in these verses in Esther chapter 3. Look at what's said in verse 2. All the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. It wasn't a power that was earned or merited that this man gained. You've got to earn the respect of those around you in life. But with Haman, that respect had to be compelled or enforced by threat, by commandment of the king himself. <clears throat> and that tells me that Haman had no standing among the people. He had no reputation. 
as far as uprightness or respect was concerned, it was a bully who only obtained reverence by force. But Mordecai refused to bow. And he did so not out of respect, disrespect to the, the office of Haman, but because of the Lord's commandment. There's nothing wrong in life generally treating people with respect and courtesy. For example, when you meet the queen, you would be asked to dress in a certain manner and bow your head if you're a man or curtsy slightly if you're a lady. When you do so, you are acknowledging her majesty's position as sovereign. And there's nothing wrong with doing such a thing as that. You are acknowledging the office as well as the person who occupies that office. However, the commandment regarding Haman was more to do with worshipping him because the terms that are used in verse 2 are generally reserved for the worship of the Lord. And the Lord says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not bow down and worship them. That can even, of course, include people. But Haman being an Amalekite was further under the Lord's condemnation. In Exodus chapter 17, because the Amalekites had attacked the unarmed children of Israel when they came out of Egypt, the Lord declared war on the Amalekites from generation to generation. Mordecai couldn't therefore bless that which the Lord had cursed. So when others bowed, Mordecai stood tall. And there's times when you and I have got to do that in life. When we've got to go against the crowd and take our stand for the Lord Jesus and swim against the tide and identify as being on the Lord's side. That's what Mordecai here was doing and not bowing. This was a matter of principle. Like Daniel refusing to stop praying in his day or Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego refusing to bow. I'm sure it wasn't easy for Mordecai to take this position. He was endangering his life. But the Lord's honour was at stake in this matter. And the Lord's honour to him, to Mordecai, was the most important thing of all. And so if his reputation failed as a consequence of not bowing to Haman, well, he regarded that as a price worth paying. Because sometimes in life, you and I have to take our stand on certain issues as far as the honour and the glory of the Lord is concerned. And when this man had made up his mind, he didn't go back on his position. Verse 4 tells us that the king's servants and those who were in the king's gate spake unto Mordecai daily. Daily. They put pressure on him, seeking to encourage him and then pressurize him to go back on his position, reminding him of his duty to obey the king's commandment. But when it comes to a choice between obeying the commandment of man and the commandment of God, the child of God must on every occasion if there a choice has to be made, we must come down always on the Lord's side. And that's what Mordecai here does. They then go a little further by threatening to report him to Haman and bringing before him the consequences of refusing to bow the knee before Haman. But there was no going back because Mordecai had told him he was a Jew. To begin not bowing and then to commence to bow would, of course, have been to ruin his testimony. You see, there's some things that Christians can't do in life because the child of God lives his life according to the standard of the word of God, not the standards of the world. And while everyone else was bowing, Mordecai stood 
He stood for Christ. He stood for the Lord. Unashamedly. He was not ashamed to own his Lord in the words of the hymn. Young person, if you're a Christian, you've got to live the life of a Christian. Don't be ashamed of telling your friends or your workmates or companions at school that you're a believer. Don't be ashamed of identifying as being on the Lord's side. Mordecai, as far as the record of scripture is concerned, up until this point in time, had really no great trouble in living for the Lord. But now the time came for Mordecai to stand up, to raise his head, if you like, above the, the parapet and to show himself on the Lord's side. And that brought out the pettiness of Haman finally. Because when Haman saw Mordecai's reaction and his steadfast refusal to go back upon his decision, well, Haman planned revenge. The Bible says in verse 6 that he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone. He thought it beneath him to take it out on Mordecai alone. Because here is a man who wants to make a name for himself. And so he determines that he will take Mordecai not only as an example, but he will show to all and sundry right throughout the kingdom of Persia and further afield that he was a man to be feared. And he determined that not only would he destroy Mordecai, but he would destroy all the Jews as well. All of Mordecai's people, all the people of God, not only those in Shushan, nor in Persia itself, but right throughout the Persian Empire in each of the 127 provinces, he wanted them all put to death. And he had the capability of doing it, humanly speaking. For he had the power and the influence. He had the ear of a Ahasuerus, no doubt. And he certainly had the bitterness of heart and pettiness of heart and depravity of heart to carry out exactly what he had planned to do destroy them all but in so doing he set himself at odds not merely with Mordecai nor with the Jews only but with the Lord himself because in seeking to destroy the Jews he was putting his hand against the people of God and that's the most dangerous thing to do this was a battle that this man couldn't win, going against God. And what of you who are without Christ? You're at odds with the Lord. You're not obeying the Lord's word. You're breaking his commandments. You are doing exactly what Haman did, putting yourself at odds with the Lord by your continued life of sin and departure from God, the Lord would call you at the end of this message tonight to faith and repentance. He would say to you, come unto me all ye that labour and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Young person, come to the Saviour. Take Christ. The Lord said to Saul of Tarsus, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. They used to use, perhaps still do, in the Middle East, a stick with a sharp end upon it. It was called an ox goat. And they would take the sharp end and they would use that sharp end to prick the ox, to get it to move. If the old ox was stubborn, of course it would stand on. But in standing its ground, of course it would get more and more pricks. And what the Lord was indicating was that Saul of Tarsus had been spoken to for a period of time by circumstances, by situations perhaps, just like the ox getting pricked with the goad. But finally the Lord broke him. 
and brought them on the road to Damascus to that place where he cried to the Lord for mercy in repentance and for grace. Oh, don't you be stubborn. Listen to the word of God. Heed the invitation of the gospel. Come to Christ. Take him as your saviour. I trust that you will if you haven't already done so. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts. Amen. We'll bow in prayer, please. Lord, we ask that thou wilt remember thy word again and open our hearts and make it receptive to the word of truth. And may the word that has been Proclaimed in our hearts, may it be outworked in our lives to the glory of the Saviour's precious name. Answer prayer. Bless each young person. Remember them. And in these times of holiday when we are somewhat away from the public worship of the Lord and from the things of God, we pray that thou wilt keep them each one and bless them throughout the summer months. Let them know thy peace and grace. Lead each young person on with thyself. And if there be those who as yet know nothing of grace and of Christ, we pray that thou wilt speak to them in the Saviour's precious name. Amen. Amen. Can I say thanks again for watching tonight? Stay safe. And I hope to catch up with you again in the autumn time. May the Lord bless you for Jesus' sake. Amen.